All right, everybody, welcome back. Today is May 2nd, 2020, which means it is National Home Brew Day, and I am taking part in the Big Brew 2020, which is put on by the American Home Brewers Association. It's actually a pretty big initiative. I have it up on my phone here right now uh, on the AHA website. It says, as of right now, which is about noon on May 2nd, we have 4,487 people who have pledged to brew today, and we have 29,000 30 gallons of beer uh, that are currently being brewed right now. So taking part in that right now is pretty cool, knowing that so many people around the country and around the world uh, are brewing right now at the same time. So the English Best Bitter that I brewed several weeks ago uh, has actually kind of got me thinking that I wanted to do something with that uh, kind of a malt profile, but a little more hops and a different kind of hop to punch through all that. So what we're doing is taking a similar grain bill but with some tweaks and uh, a very different yeast and we're uh, adding some Simcoe hops to it. Simcoe is a very piney pungent kind of catty almost hop that, uh, that tends to punch through uh, heavier malts a lot cleaner um, than those earthy British hops that I used in, uh, in the Best Bitter. The Amber Ale really should be something between a red IPA and an English Bitter. Uh, so it's gonna have English malts and American malts. It's gonna have a subdued caramel character to it uh, And it's gonna have a good decent amount of hoppiness just enough to be noticed and it should definitely be a part of the style uh, It should not be subdued, but it also should not be the highlight of the style uh, So it's gonna be a sort of a middle ground between everything there. I'm actually pretty excited to use Simcoe again uh, It's been a long time since I've played with Simcoe. It is one of my favorite hops and if you're one of the, if you're one of those people that really likes that pine character uh, that certain West Coast beers have, then uh, Simcoe is the hop for you. So hopefully everybody's doing okay during this time, uh, and hopefully I can provide a good source of entertainment for you during this period of time. So sit back, grab a beer or two, and let's work on this amber ale together. So for the recipe, um, we're looking at 10 pounds of Maris Otter base malt. Maris Otter is an English base malt that basically is going to provide a lot more kind of biscuity fullness chewiness to the to malt profile here this is going to be a beer that's going to balance between maltiness and hoppiness so we definitely want to have a decent amount of a uh, a good strong malt backbone uh, so we're going to add a pound of crystal 40 to that uh, which is going to give us partly color partly flavor um, we're going to add a pound of munich malt to it Munich malt is going to help round out that, uh, that malt profile even more. One pound of special roast. Special roast is another grain that uh, was in that English bitter that really contributed to the fullness of its flavor. It's, it's basically victory malt with a kick. Uh, and then we're going to add one ounce of chocolate malt. Uh, very specifically pale chocolate malt. Uh, and that is just that touch of chocolate malt is going to add the perfect color hopefully uh, I have over I have used this technique multiple times to make my beers uh, a certain shade of red and I have overdone it once before and it turned out brown we don't want that um, we're gonna keep it hopefully towards the lighter end of the spectrum around 12.3 SRM as calculated by Beersmith so we'll see if that works um, all of this malt should hopefully bring us to a uh, expected original gravity of 1057 so moving on to hops, I'm actually going to focus this one on all boil additions, on all late boil additions. So we have a lot of hop flavor, but not necessarily an aggressive bitterness like you would find in an IPA. So starting at 20 minutes, I am using one ounce of Simcoe. Simcoe that I have is 12.7% alpha acids. So then at 10 minutes, we're going to add another ounce. And at zero minutes, we're going to add another ounce. And that's it. So hopefully this beer has a decent amount of flavor, a mild amount of bitterness, and a decent amount of aroma as well. So hopefully that classic character of Simcoe, the pininess, the pungency, will just absolutely cut through uh, the caramel and the biscuit flavors that you get from the malt. Uh, hopefully it works pretty well. Uh, so for yeast, it is now time for me to start digging into my dry yeast supply. Uh, <laughs> I've been very hesitant to order liquid yeast online, so I'm adding... Uh, so I'm starting to use my dry yeast. We're going to use a classic US05, the red packet from Saf Ale. Uh, it's pretty clean and good fermenting yeast, and I've very rarely had any issues with it. We just want to kind of ferment it on the lower end of the spectrum. So for water, I'm going to be using uh, the exact same water profile that I used in the Best Bitter, uh, because it is actually a very, very useful water profile. 
Um, kind of turns out that it plays very well with hops and all of those uh, nice biscuity notes. Um, also, you'll notice that my ion counts are actually very high uh, because I'm using my city's water profile to start with. Uh, I'm not using reverse osmosis water. If so, you're gonna have lower ion counts probably. Um, also, I'm only providing this to you as a uh, frame of reference if you wish to replicate this because everyone's water supply that they're starting out with is gonna be very different. So the amount of salts that you add and what salts you add are going to be different for everybody. So just do your due diligence and calculate this yourself uh, using Beersmith or an online calculator. So I have a video on water chemistry I did a long time ago. I'm gonna link it up here in the corner and it might help make some of this stuff a little bit more uh, understandable. Just know that in this style, we want a decently high amount of calcium and magnesium for yeast health and for beer clarity. Uh, and also we want a sulfate to chloride ratio of roughly two to one or 2.5 to one in this case. It's gonna help brighten up the uh, hop flavor and it's also going to kind of lend a drier finish to the beer, at least in terms of how it feels, uh, it, which will lend itself to having a higher drinkability in the long run. So this profile is 110 parts per million of calcium, 24 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, 255 parts per million of sulfate, 100 parts per million of chloride, and 79 parts per million of bicarbonate. Um, and I am treating all of my mash and sparge water at once. So I filled the whole kettle up, added my salts, added a Camden tablet, uh, which by the way will remove the chlorine taste that you might have in your beer uh, if you're using city water. And then at that point I would let off a couple gallons for sparge and the remainder of the water in there is going to be used for mash. Um, I added 13 grams of gypsum, 8 grams of epsom, and 3 grams of chalk to the water uh, to get that water profile. So for a mash, we're just going to do a standard middle of the road, 152 degrees Fahrenheit for 60 minutes. So hopefully that brings us a good mix of fermentability and residual sweetness uh, at the end of the day. We're going to sparge with 170 degree Fahrenheit water and uh, we're going to target a pre-boil volume of 8 gallons. Alright, so we've already added those salts in the Camden tablet, like I said, a while back, and everything is up to temp, so all we got to do is walk over to the kitchen and dough in. Uh, this box right here is about 45 pounds of different grains, hops, and uh, a little bit of dry yeast. Um, and I'm going to be using this to supply my next three brews. And I do want to do a little plug here for my local home brew shop, because they were amazing and delivered this to me in three days. Now, I am a local customer, so that might make a difference, but uh, I was previously using Northern Brewer, um, and they are great, uh, and they have all of the ingredients you would ever want, but they are going to be experiencing some shipping delays right now because, well, obvious reasons. They're probably a little bit swamped by orders right now. Uh, my local homebrew shop ships to the New England area, so if you are a New Englander and you don't want to wait forever for your ingredients, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put a link in the description to the website for my local homebrew shop and hopefully they can help you out. And right now, obviously, small businesses really are suffering a lot, so the local shops, the smaller homebrew shops, really do uh, need your business. These guys shipped 50 pounds to my door in three days for $8 shipping and handling, so give them a look if you're in the area. If you are outside of the New England area, though, I'm sure that they will still ship to you. Uh, I just would advise giving them a call or an email first. Um, they are awesome guys and they're definitely there to help you out. So I use this recirculation system that I kind of built for myself uh, last year and um, that is not necessary to brew this beer. I just want to make that very clear. Uh, if you got an igloo cooler or you're doing a standard brew in a bag kind of thing and just wrapping up your kettle, that is going to work fine. The biggest benefit of the recirculation for me though is that I can consistently maintain a single mash temperature. So anyway, I'm gonna just pull some of this hardware out and we'll put it back in when we're ready to start the mash. But for now, let's dough in.
All right, so I've let the mash sit for a total of one hour and uh, we've been continuously recirculating the entire time. So now it's time to collect all that wort and uh, start preparing for the boil. So what I typically do is actually stop the recirculation and then pump wort from this kettle into this kettle. That will be our first runnings and then I will use the sparge water that I have here on the side, which is almost up to temp, uh, and we'll use that to sparge We'll recirculate again for a little while until we get clear wort and that grain bed is set. And then I will pump that into this kettle again for our second runnings. And then once we hit eight gallons, which is the total capacity of this guy, uh, then we will pump back into the main kettle for uh, our boil. So we're gonna get to that now. All right, so this is our pre-boil gravity. Uh, it's about 10 and a half bricks, which translates to 1041. We are only two points short of the target, so that's not bad. Uh, we can definitely make that up in the boil. All right, so we are at the top of the boil right now. Uh, there is no 60 minute bittering addition in this particular beer. So we are gonna wait until we have 20 minutes left in the boil, and uh, then we'll start adding our first hop addition. All right, so it is now 40 minutes into the boil and therefore it's time for our first hop addition at 20 minutes, which is one ounce of Simcoe. So I'm just gonna chuck that in right now. We'll come back in 10 minutes, add more hops and stuff. All right, so it's now 10 minutes from the end of the boil. So we're gonna start by adding our 10 minute hop addition, which is another ounce of Simcoe. Real easy to measure these. Next thing I'm gonna add is two and a half teaspoons of yeast nutrient. And last but certainly not least, we are adding one Whirlflock tablet, which is gonna help uh, ensure a clear beer at the end of this process. All right, so the next thing that's gonna happen around the 10 minute mark is uh, gonna do with this chiller. So here we have my plate chiller. In your case, it might be a plate chiller, an immersion chiller, a counterflow chiller, whatever chilling system you have set up. It helps to incorporate a step around the 10 minute mark where you sanitize that chiller using the boiling temperature of the wort. So assuming that your chiller is clean to begin with, recirculating the wort through this thing at uh, 10 minutes while it boils will ensure that it kills off any sort of microbes that are inside of it. that you may not have reached with your sanitizer solution or with uh, just a good thorough cleaning process. So we're gonna set that up now. All right, it is time to end the boil now. It's zero minutes, so I'm gonna shut off all the heat sources. And we're gonna to toss in our final hop addition here, the last ounce of Simcoe. I'm gonna pull the heat stick out and we're actually gonna cover the kettle up a little bit here to try and preserve some hop aroma. All right, so now it's time to start chilling. So I hope you can see that through a proper adjustment of the output of the chiller, the output of the cooling water, and the output of the pump results in a very fast chill. All 
All right, so while this cools down completely, uh, I'll talk quickly about fermentation here because it's going to take a second for it to go from 80 down to 60. So fermentation for this particular beer should be relatively straightforward and easy. It is a standard ale fermentation as are 90% of the beers that I make here on this channel. 65 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit for about two weeks. Uh, I am using the US05 yeast though, which I haven't used in a while. And in my experience, US05 tends to throw off some somewhat fruity esters uh, if you ferment it higher. So I'm gonna do my best to bring everything down to about 65 pitch at that temperature and then try to keep it at 65 uh, for the entire fermentation. This will slow down fermentation overall, but should produce a cleaner flavor at the end of the day. I'm using a single packet of USO5 and I'm rehydrating that yeast prior to pitching it. So you do run the risk of shocking that yeast pretty badly if you just toss it right onto the wort. Um, so it's generally good practice to rehydrate. It just ensures that your yeast are awake, ready to receive sugars, and then when you pitch that into the actual wort, uh, you end up with less fermentation related off flavors. Um, it works without it, but in my experience, when I've just pitched the uh, dry yeast right onto the wort, I've actually had uh, pretty bad fermentation overall, and sometimes those, those beers don't even finish completely. They just stall. Uh, so I'd rather have a healthy fermentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and take that extra step of rehydrating everything. This brew day was awesome. Uh, total polar opposite of the Citra Double IPA uh, that I made a couple weeks ago. Uh, I had a very bad brew day then, <laughs> but this one was definitely a very good one. This beer is very easy to brew, I'll tell you that much. Uh, hopefully it turns out to be pretty good. I think it's awesome to be home brewing at the same time as so many of you out there. So I put a post on my Instagram this afternoon about National Home Brew Day, and it turns out so many of you guys are participating in this at the same time. So it's actually really, really cool to be brewing virtually alongside of you during this time. We have a pretty awesome hobby, so it's, uh, it's pretty cool to be doing that. Uh, at the same time as everybody. So happy brewing. So hopefully your big brew 2020 uh, for National Homebrew Day went just as well as mine did. All right, so I actually let the cooling process go on for a while uh, and it's now actually down to what looks like 55 degrees, which is pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, we're gonna go ahead and transfer the wort now over into the fermenter here. Uh, this has been sanitized and all we're gonna do is just pause the pump so one of the elements of having a successful fermentation is ensuring that the wort is well aerated when uh, you pitch your yeast. That allows the yeast cells to reproduce quickly and uh, allows for a cleaner fermentation. And one of the ways that I do that is uh, just by splashing the wort coming into the fermenter uh, somewhat aggressively and generating lots of large bubbles. And uh, that ensures that you have a decent amount of oxygen distributed throughout the wort. So we will do that until this is complete. All right, so as you can see, the wort has been completely aerated. The bubbles are flowing out of the bucket. <laughs> so I think we got enough oxygen in there. So now it's time to pitch our yeast. So uh, we've got our solution of rehydrated USO5 here. So we're just gonna go ahead and swirl that up, or well, pitch a little bit in there now. Then we'll swirl it up. And in it goes. All right, so we should be good. Uh, so now cap it up and let it ferment. All right, so here is the original gravity. Uh, looks like it's about 13 and a half bricks, which translates to about 1053 OG, uh, which is a little low, about four points low. Um, but that's all right. It's still within the uh, target range we really want. So probably end up with something like a five point something beer, uh, which is fine. All right, so here's the final gravity on the Amber Ale, and uh, it's looking good. It looks like it finished just about 10.10, maybe 10.11, but I think it's 10.10. And a real nice color, too. It's going to look very nice in the glass, I think. So we're going to cold crash this tonight and keg it soon. All right, so the fermentation actually went pretty well, pretty smoothly. Um, like I forecasted, uh, dropping that temperature down to about 65 did slow things down quite a bit. Uh, so it took about 12 days to completely finish out. Uh, then I let it sit in the fermenter for another couple days, and then we kegged once I had a reliable final gravity. All right, so then I cold crashed for a couple days, and then I kegged it, put it on gas, and uh, we are ready to drink it. All right, so the beer turned out pretty well, and there's really nothing special to talk about in the fermentation, so let's just go ahead and drink it. All right, so it's called Little Big Brew, and uh, came in at about 5.7% ABV and 35 IBUs. So 
but the appearance of the beer, it's a, it's a real nice deep amber. Um, it's like an orange copper color, I think. Uh, it's definitely a solid amber color. It's not red, it's not uh, gold, you know, it's, it's really right in the middle of that. Totally clear too, which is what we want. And um, the head of the beer is, it's not super strong because I didn't really carbonate it that heavily. And I think I'm fine with that. Um, it's nice, tight, compact bubbles though. And it's, uh, it's kind of like an off-white, slightly cream colored head. Um, looks pretty good, doesn't stick around for too long, but there is a layer that sticks around on top of the glass. All right, moving in for aroma. So the aroma of this was originally going to be like a pine uh, aroma, but um, it actually turned out to be grapefruit. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely very grapefruit dominated. The aroma, there's also a lot of like toasty type uh, malt character that comes out through the aroma as well. Um, but yeah, like overall the aroma is definitely hop uh, dominated, but not in the way that I really wanted. I did want the pine character of the Simcoe to come through, but it didn't. It came there as more of a, uh, a grapefruit. What I'm happy to report though, is that I don't get any of the cattiness or like ammonia-like uh, characteristic that Simcoe has known uh, has been known to throw. There's a lot of like sweet biscuit coming through in the aroma as well. And then we'll move forward to mouthfeel. It's like a, um, a good solid medium mouthfeel, um, you know, not being too heavily carbonated. That definitely helps out a lot. It's, um, it's highly drinkable, I think. It does feel like it finished dry, and even though it's not, you know, not too heavy, not too light. This is about, you know, this is obviously quite a bit stronger than the bitter was initially. Uh, so if we're comparing these two beers, uh, then I would definitely say that the bitter is more drinkable. Uh, but at the same time, this isn't really that far behind. Uh, there's just definitely a little bit more uh, presence in the mouthfeel, and that does come from mashing higher and having a higher amount of ABV. All right, going in for flavor. That is, that is an American Amber Ale. Uh, <laughs> flavor wise, we get a lot of malt. Um, it's, uh, it's just got a really great kind of modern biscuity kind of character. Um, I say modern because, I mean, I'm gonna continuously compare this to the British bitter that I made, um, which is an older style of beer. I really do think that uh, this has a little bit more of a kind of caramel kind of character that is not present in most English ales. Um, and I, I like that. However, in, in pretty much every other category of the malt in this beer, it really does resemble the bitter quite seriously. Um, I mean, I did use Maris Otter and, you know, I used, uh, what was the other malt? Special Roast. Both of those things were key contributors to the biscuit flavor uh, that I had in that bitter. Um, but the one thing that this really does stand out for the bitter on is just straight up hop character. Um, now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I really was going for a lot more of the piney character that you would get from Simcoe, which I think would fit well in this style. The the late boil, 20 minute and less additions that I did really kind of extracted more of a fruity grapefruit uh, character as opposed to a pine character, which does kind of surprise me. Um, I didn't think that, that was the dominant flavor in Simcoe, but it might be. That character might also vary from crop to crop. Um, it doesn't come up in the aroma. I really get absolutely zero pine <laughs> whatsoever. Um, so maybe I would add some Chinook to this if I were uh, brewing in the future, uh, just to really guarantee I get some nice pine notes. Um, but it's not really ruined. It's, uh, it's not what I was going for, um, but it is an American Amber Ale and it works. Uh, it's a balanced beer between both bitterness and maltiness. Uh, it's a beer that's definitely great from draft. Uh, it's just very, very satisfying. Um, and it has just all those wonderful characteristics of uh, having a good balance between it. You know, you have some of the interesting flavor profiles from the malt, and you also have a little bit of a hint of some interesting color from the, uh, from the hops. And, um, you know, while it's not what I was going for, it's definitely pretty good. The one thing that having only late boil additions uh, did for this really well, though, is, uh, is really reducing that bitterness. So this is... You know, you'll notice like most of my hoppy beers, the first thing you notice is punchy bitterness. And that's the point. Um, but with this beer, it's malt forward at first. And then it transitions over into a malt plus hops kind of combo. Um, and that was the whole intention there. And it worked beautifully. 
Uh, there is absolutely no punchy bitterness towards the beginning of this. It is all uh, just allows you to take the full breadth of that malty character and, um, and really enjoy it. I think it works out well in that regard. I personally, as a fan of hoppier beers, I do really kind of prefer having at least a little bit of bitterness in there. So I think next time I still would put a 60 minute addition in, but perhaps not to a great degree of bitterness. Uh, so this has been sitting in the keg for about, I think, four days now? Four or five days? Um, but basically the first couple of days it was pretty cloudy, you know, because it uh, was just transferred and a little bit turbid. Um, and the USO5 yeast character uh, does really kind of lend quite a um, uh, out of place <laughs> fruity note to this whole thing. So I'm very glad that when that dropped out, uh, all we're left with is malt and hops. It is a very clean yeast, it's a very clean character, and I do enjoy using it. You just have to use it right. <laughs> it's not as hesitant to drop out as some yeast strains. Um, and it's definitely not as pleasant of a flavor as other yeast strains. Um, it is worth it letting your beer drop clear and uh, making sure you have a clean pint when you pour it. But um, overall, pretty good beer. Pretty happy with the way that this one turned out. There is a good reason why this is one of the original styles of American craft beer, and that is because it is so approachable. Um, you know, it's not overdone with the malt, it's not overdone with the hops, it really does come through in a really balanced platform. And I think is very, very acceptable to your average person. Um, I, I find very few people out there who don't think that an amber ale is a beer that they would drink. This thing does taste pretty much like every other amber ale I've ever ordered at a bar. I mean, it is kind of a generic style, <laughs> but it's, it's a good style. It's a very approachable style, like I said. You know what it really reminds me of, which is interesting, a Sam Adams Boston Lager, but as an ale, um, which reminds me maybe I should try and brew something like that because it's just a Vienna Lager. This is on my list. I mean, it's a great pub beer. But this, this taste of this really does kind of bring me back to good times and some bars and pubs that uh, I enjoyed before this whole disease thing destroyed everything. So this is a pretty good beer. Um, I'm pretty satisfied with the way it came out, especially after letting it drop clean. Um, I would not change anything about the malt. I would not change anything about the yeast. Um, that, on that note, the chocolate malt edition, that half a percent that I added is, uh, I think that adds a really, really cool dimension uh, to this whole thing because I mentioned earlier in the video, I have overdone that. Um, if you look at my American Strong Ale, that is a great example of uh, a time that I overdid the chocolate malt. And it ended up being a very overpowering flavor that was just, it was unpleasant. Um, it needed a lot of time to age and round out. And um, well, that can ruin a beer like this. So it's definitely important to keep that on the low side, but it does add a lot of malt complexity that you wouldn't get if you did something like Red X uh, for your base malt and got you know that perfect red color just from that one malt. I think you need multiple malts in this to achieve a good level of malt complexity. Um, and the, the bill that I have right now is actually pretty good. I really do think that this is, uh, this is quite good for this style. So the one thing that I do really want to change about this is the hop schedule. So I, as a person, really do enjoy having uh, a lot more hop character in my beers. Um, I want a little bit of bitterness in there to kind of cut through the malt at the beginning. And I like to detect something that adds a little bit of complexity to everything. It's just a very generic, balanced beer, um, which is fine if that's what you're looking for. But I like a little bit hoppier things, you know, so I would add a little bit of I would add like a very small bittering addition. You could still use Simcoe as a bittering addition. It does pretty decently as a bittering hop, uh, but at the same time, you could also use something cleaner like Warrior. Uh, I think it would do pretty well. Just a small amount, you know, nothing nothing too serious in terms of IBUs, just something to get a little bit of, you know, nice cut and bite through the beginning of this. And then I would keep the 2010 zero minute additions perfectly fine, just the way they are. Um, that did work very well, I think, at introducing a decent amount of flavor and balance. Um, so just needs a little bit of a shove in the uh, the bitter direction, I think, to be totally perfectly balanced um, to the way that I like it. Then maybe I would add a little bit of Chinook, uh, which is a decent piney hop as well. If you add Chinook and Simcoe together, you're really going to multiply the pine flavor, I think, uh, and aroma. And so, yes, you could probably dry hop this a little bit if you wanted to, but if you add too many hops, it's going to verge into the kind of red pale ale or even red IPA territory. Um, so just kind of keep that to a minimum. Um, amber ale is not supposed to be hoppy, but 
but I just can't live without hoppy beer. So that's just my own personal flaws. So I think overall, I'm gonna give this a seven and a half out of 10. I'm taking points away because I really do wish it had more hop character and in a different way. I do wish the piney character came out more than the grapefruity character. Um, not to say it's a bad beer at all, it definitely isn't. I think this is definitely a very tasty beer, a uh, very approachable beer, and I think it did a decent job with the style. <clears throat> I definitely think it could have been a lot better at the same time, and I'm always gonna do that. So if you like the video, just do me a favor and hit that like button real quick. Uh, it does help my channel out quite a bit in terms of visibility, and uh, if you like seeing this stuff on a regular basis, please hit the subscribe button because I typically put out videos like this, grain to glass, uh, pretty frequently, every couple weeks, and um, sometimes I'll even kick out equipment videos Videos or technique videos and stuff like that uh, just to keep things a little bit interesting during this time I think we can use a little extra entertainment so I do my best to provide if you brewed this beer if you have comments on the beer your thoughts questions concerns whatever drop them in the comment section down below and I will get back to you as soon as I can I do read every single comment that I get and I do my best to respond to as many as I can uh, but I do work a full-time job so it does take a minute for me to get to some of them but I will get back to you in time but yeah let me know your thoughts on this beer and especially if you want to try and make this yourself it is a really easy beer to make you know I get a lot of messages on Instagram that ask me hey what kind of beer should I make for my first beer and this is definitely one of the ones that I would point you towards so I do encourage you to check it out um speaking of which i do post here on youtube every two weeks or so um depending on how fast i can brew uh and empty kegs as well but i do have an instagram it is at the apartment brewer and uh, there i'll tend to post every couple days so uh, if you follow me there you'll be able to see things that might make their way to the youtube channel in a couple weeks and uh, you'll be able to follow my brewing endeavors in real time so if you check out the description box down below, you will find a complete recipe for this beer in a five and a half gallon format, because that's what I brew with. And um, if you want to make that for yourself, just feel free to reference that. Also, I have a complete list of all the equipment that I use to brew beer with and links to Amazon where you could purchase it for yourself if you wish to. Um, <clears throat> I don't mean to put any pressure on you at all, but if you're in the market for any sort of brewing equipment, um, then if you use one of those links and actually purchase something, I do earn very small commission, uh, but it's at no additional cost to you and it does help out the channel monetarily, so I do appreciate it. All right, so thank you for making it all the way to the end of the video. I do appreciate your time and for watching this video. It does mean a lot to me. I do really enjoy this, actually. Uh, so I will catch you in the next one. Until then, cheers, guys.